Now it's time to really get down and dirty and talk all things related to Galaxy S24 Ultra. <laughs> and I've said it and I'm standing on it and I'm telling you, you can cry about it. This is already my phone of the year. And I'm telling you, where I am right now in my particular journey as a tech content creator, right? I'm not easily impressed when it comes to smartphones, especially, especially these traditional metal slab phones that are not foldables. I'm not easily impressed, right? So it takes a lot. And to impress me, it takes a lot, but it's not about being a perfect phone. But you just have to hit certain things across the board and have an have a feeling and affinity and a, a, a care that says a lot that you mean business when you're going above that one thousand pound, one thousand dollar, one thousand euro price point. And boy, Samsung, Samsung, you've been in your bag when it comes to masterclass and refinement for making these ultra devices. And right now, to me, you're in the league of your own. <laughs> This answers so much issues I've had since the S21 Ultra. We're here now. S21 Ultra felt like yesterday when I was in, in Dubai enjoying portrait video mode on a selfie camera in 1080p with no stabilization. Now I've got it in 4K, on the selfie, 8K, on the zoom, 8K, on the One X. Bruh, you don't know so many things that's going through my mind when it comes to the experience on this device, man, but we're gonna break it down. We're gonna talk about it. We're gonna go through the things that are really important, starting from the outside and working our way in. First, we're gonna be talking about the design and the build quality. What's my experience been like, actually experiencing what it's been, away from all the marketing that they've talked about. The display, was it the right decision to go all flat and move away from all the curviness that they had started from what they had way back when, right? And even how they had it quite subtle with the S23 Ultra, had it very pronounced with the S22 Ultra. Was it right for them to go from this to this? Design and build quality of the Galaxy S24 Ultra, right? You've got several colors that come with it. You've got the um, black, you've got the, um, what do you call it, the yellow, you've got the natural, uh, the, the titanium gray, and then of course you've got the titanium violet. I've seen all of them, experienced all of them. I've had my hands on with them. Of course, go watch my hands on video on the S24 Ultra where I showed all the colors and my experience of it. And I'll just say straight, this titanium gray is my favorite color. You can't see it on the camera right now. You can probably to an extent, but depending on how the light hits it, there's a slight sheen and color change when it comes to gold where I really, really, really love this. Let's really break down what has really changed generationally. And I think context wise, with the S23 Ultra and the S22 Ultra, it will give you a better idea of where the progression has gone. You can see it from a very, very, very heavily pronounced curved screen to a much more subtle journey to what you have here with the S23 Ultra to this. And the biggest thing you're gonna really see is, it's not just the curve change going to a much more flat design, but also now going from a glossy frame to a matte frame, a satin matte frame. Look at that. No yucky fingerprints, man. And, them making a completely flat display. Look at that. It's completely flat, baby. What does that basically mean? It basically means you're gonna have a nicer time with things like this. Screen protectors. And obviously, not sponsored, but if you want a quality screen protector, man, it's gotta be white stone dome. It's gotta be white stone dome. It's always gotta be white stone dome. It's expensive, yes, it's got a bit of a price tag on it. It's a bit cumbersome initially to install, but it's absolutely worth it. You're gonna have a better time with things like this. But you see, away from screen protectors alone, what it basically means is less screen glare. You would get a lot of light refraction on the edges that you would see, right? No, not with a flat display. So then making a completely flat display, you would think they would have actually made the edges completely flat. No, 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 no. Look at it very, very, very carefully straight on, right? There is a nice, subtle, curve, bulb there that makes it feel so 
<laughs> so good to hold. It feels so good to hold. Oh my goodness. This is such a subtle thing. It's not so obvious, but when you look at it, right, there's enough of a curve that hits here to here that when you hold it without a case, ah, uh, this phone feels criminal to put a case on it. I kid you not. You're gonna be very, 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 very upset to put a case on this. This is, and I'm gonna say it, the nicest feeling ultra phone Samsung have made. This is an even better feeling phone than the iPhone 15 Pro Max, even with their version of titanium. They have knocked out of the park. This design, I do not care what anyone says. I have no complaints with this design. Just to clarify some few things, Samsung have stated that the titanium is just for the frame. They have not stated what grade titanium it is. And it doesn't necessarily add less weight as such. It has made it late, you know, less, less of a you know, weight by like maybe one gram, but the weight distribution is a lot better. The weight distribution is a lot better. Look at this thing under the camera and the light, man. This, man, this thing is gorgeous. This thing is gorgeous, I'm going through it. I'm going through it. This is a masterclass of design, man. I, I kid you not. I've not felt this excited and happy about a phone's design, right, since, <laughs> I don't think since, uh, what, the Galaxy S7 Edge? What we have here is a completely flat display, Corning Gorilla Glass Armor, which is meant to be way less reflective. And I'm not gonna, uh, there's people that have showed great demonstration, right? We're gonna get to that, but I'm gonna give my feeling of what I felt when I was using it, without thinking about the marketing of um, you know seventy five less seventy five percent less um, what you call it reflective, um, four times more scratch resistant and smash resistant compared to your normal aluminium silicate glass and all of that. I wasn't thinking about that, but just there was a feeling I had when I was looking at this, and I was like, there's something different about this display. We're gonna get into it, and we're gonna talk about that. So flat, completely symmetrical borders, Gorilla Glass armor only on the front, first phone to have this experience. Then when we go into the display, we go here. Of course, you've got the ability to go into dark mode, but we go into light mode because the exposure for the camera is a lot better. Adaptive brightness, extra brightness, of course, that's there. It really helps. Adaptive brightness is what helps with the vision booster. So you get that in. Adaptive refresh rate, of course, this is using LTPO technology. Adaptive refresh rate between one hertz all the way up to 120 hertz, which is what we love to see. Maybe in the future they might go up to 144 hertz, but hey, look, at this point, we just take what we get and what we experience, it's not that deep. Then, of course, what we have, there's this, but we're gonna talk about that in a minute. Then we've got the resolution. So you can see that the resolution is slightly higher, but technically it's the same, just, just based on aspect ratio difference, okay? Okay, baby, okay, okay, so. The reason why I say that is if you look here and you go into the turn off adaptive um, brightness, you go here, the resolution on here says 3120 by 1440. This is 3088 by 1440. So it's just a slight aspect ratio change, ever so slightly higher on this, but this is just me being factually, objectively obtuse and picking differences, right? Same for Galaxy S22 Ultra. Right, we go to display here. You see it? 3088. 3088. If we put it all here, right, this is what we've got. You can see this is actually slightly more compact. Do you, do you see what I mean in terms of the generational refinement and just chiseling and making everything just that much more refined? Boom, that's what we've got right here. What, did we, what, else, what else are we experiencing when it comes to the display? When we go to the display mode, right, you can already notice the difference when it comes to vibrancy. So we go to Vivid. I would say this, that there is a slight vibrancy and saturation that you get with the S23 Ultra, where this feels much more natural. Even in the Vivid mode, this feels way more natural, right? So there is a slight more pop on this one, but you see there's a clarity on here that is just unmatched. The clarity that you get on here is just unmatched. It's just so good, right? And it's really one of the things that really stood out to me, right? 
and it stood out to me amongst other things. Peak brightness on this was 1,750 nits. We now get a peak brightness of 2,600 nits. We're gonna test it to see, I've not tested it yet. We're gonna test it and see what the peak brightness that we're getting in our situation, right? We're gonna test that. This is something that works with the adaptive brightness on with Vision Booster and it's great to see this. But you see, it makes even more of a difference because this Corning Gorilla Glass Armor, I'll tell you this now, away from what they told us marketing wise, it went over my head because I thought, oh, here we go. This is another year of Corning claiming that they've got something that we're like, yeah, okay, cool. This time, when I was using it outdoors and I was using it in general, it just felt so clear. I don't know how to explain it. Maybe it's down to the less reflections and stuff here, but it just looks so clear. I feel like I didn't need to boost the brightness that much to get it looking as bright or brighter than what I was experiencing with the S23 Ultra and the S22 Ultra. It just felt clear. I felt like I was seeing through like a crystal clear window. I don't know how to explain it. That's probably the best way I can explain it. And it's really, really down to that. This front glass, I've seen people demonstrate it. It's definitely less reflective, but you see, for me, it's the, it's just got a, a, a sheen and a clarity to what you're looking through. It is more of a difference maker than I thought it would do, but you see, in my mind, it's more the clarity, right? It's just so, it just feels so clear. When I'm watching videos, I'm going through the menus, you know, and especially when I've got dark mode on, for example, the settings, it just looks so clear. But yeah, it's it's just so clear. So I really love what, that's, what they're putting forward. Of course, the S Pen experience, what they said is the X-Pen experience is basically still the same, which isn't a bad thing. So obviously if you go into the camera, you can use it to remote trigger. Um, you know, you can use um, the S-Pen um, smart select. There's so much, basically the S-Pen experience is still the same. Nothing's changed, which isn't a bad thing. You know, it's still the best built in stylus experience. And we just hope that they bring it to the full generation six. Just putting it out there, hope so. But the display experience, man, to me as a complete package with S-Pen support, whether you like it or not, QHD at 20, uh, 3120 by 1440p, um, dynamic 2X um, AMOLED display, peak brightness of 2600 nits, with vision booster, the new Corning Gorilla Glass Armor Glass, flat display completely, which gives you a, a nicer time with you know screen protectors, the Gorilla Glass Armor that really just allows for a less reflective, hopefully stronger impact, less strats resistant, but just a clearer look, less reflective, allows for a much more brighter display experience. You know, 120 hertz adaptive refresh rate, completely symmetrical borders that are slim now on a flat display. This is just more than a return to form. This is masterclass again. How do they push it better? I made a joke in my hands-on video that at this point, like what? Are you gonna give us a 2160p display? What's next, a, a, a 3000 a plus nits display? You, it's 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 almost ridiculous. The only thing that they can really perfect going forward is going to be the UDC under display camera that they're platforming on their on their on their fold series. That's the only way I can see this, where it's a completely hidden front facing camera. You know, the fingerprint scanner. You know, it feels as fast as ever. Where maybe maybe it's just a positive placebo effect, but I kind of feel like it's you know maybe in its brand new phone stage that it's quite. Snappy. Maybe it's a placebo effect, but it does to me feel like the fingerprint scanner is actually faster, which is still my preferred method of biometric unlock. I do not like having a fat pill right there, right? This is just a cleaner and better looking design by far. This display, masterclass. Another 10 out of 10. What can I say? Back to back wins, 10 out of 10? Display as well? Ah, it's just, just it's just clean. Samsung showing again why they do give you the best display experience on a smartphone. This is just another friendly reminder. They've got your notice. Yeah, best in class display on a smartphone right now. For me personally, feature set, user experience, there's no ifs or but like you, I'm sorry people, you cannot complain about Samsung displays in any way user experience, shape or form anymore. They've knocked out the park. It's perfect now. Two things so far that I've given 10 out of 10. Design, display experience, what we got next? Performance. And performance wise, we are here on behalf of the Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 mobile platform built for Galaxy or Snapdragon 8 Gen 3 built for Galaxy. And this was announced 
um, as the global chipset that will be powering the S24 Ultra. There is no split with Exynos, it's not dragging all the way. This is something that Qualcomm did announce when it comes to their Snapdragon Summit. Um, this is based on TSMC's third generation four nanometer process, which isn't three nanometers. I think all of the initial three nanometer die shrinks are pretty much just given to Apple only. So something to consider when it comes to that. Performance wise, yeah, it's, it's phenomenal. And everything is all based around generative AI performance and AI, um, what do you call it? Performance that you're getting. Let's go to history. Benchmark wise, this is the numbers that I was getting, right? Let's go pull it up here. This is Geekbench right here. If I can pull up Geekbench 6 on here as well, then we can see comparatively, right? This is what we have, the S23 Ultra. So you have a gauge and understanding of the progressive change. And if I can find Geekbench, let me just download it for the iPhone, just to give you a perspective of what we're doing in terms of reference benchmarking and performance numbers that we have. Here we are, this is how we, we're scaling in terms of general performance. Of course, three nanometers, first generation, four nanometers, um, third generation, four nanometers, second generation. First generation was obviously what we had with the eight gen one, that was in Samsung's fabrication. Eight plus gen one switched to TSMC's. We saw a big difference when it came to the Fold 4 and the devices that supported it. Um, yeah, this is pretty much what we have here right now. Apple definitely in terms of the raw performance, but the GPU on here is meant to be really, really strong as well. So. I think overall the performance, especially when it comes to multi-core, the performance disparity is about 500 points, not too much. The performance disparity on here on a single core is quite much higher, which is about more than 700. So take that into account. Um, yeah, performance wise though, S24 Ultra, it really does feel nice and snappy, fluid, right? That's what nine? One thing obviously I do love about the Snapdragon platform based devices, especially when it comes to these flagships, is the extra performance that you get in terms of options. If you go here, you go to game settings, you go to display, for example, you get 60 um, FPS, but then you do get visual quality different settings. You don't even get this on the iPhone. So I don't know if it's on high quality already. You've got default, you've got performance, and you've got the visual quality high. So this is something that's really nice to have. Um, so let's go in. Uh, okay, let's just keep it. Uh, let's try default first. Uh, just to save being copyrighted, I'm just gonna go back. Um, let's just jump in. There we go. So we're just gonna launch into this here. Play some rounds. Do 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 do. So this is Asphalt 9. I don't really mobile game, but when I do, it is always Asphalt. Man, the lack of reflections as well, even on the studio light is so good. It's so good. If you do like mobile games, man, this platform is excellent for it, of course. All right, so what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna do a visual change. We're gonna go to higher quality, right? So we're gonna restart it. Now let's see what the visual quality does to the frame rate, since obviously this is powered by the 8 Gen 3. Not sure if they've optimized it, but there's just a high chance that they will, um, you know, do that. So this is some live gameplay performance, and in terms of temperature and cooling, you can see that this is nice and cool, 34.6 degrees Celsius. Yeah, it feels nice and cool in the hand. Yeah. Um, no issues there at all, love that. Let's just go here, touch the drive. I'm gonna play downhill. Yeah, so it feels nice and cool to the touch, really love it, great phone. So yeah, even with the visual quality upgrade, um, high visual quality, you're still getting 60 FPS. Um, HM3 is looking nice, feeling nice. Um, heat is greatly controlled. So obviously you've got the Yep, search, circle to search by Google. So here is the settings for it here. The navigation bar, circle to search, touch and hold the home button or the navigation handle to search using content. Now you can disable it. Right, swipe inwards 
for one from one of the bottom corners to open up the digital assistant app. Okay, search screen. Right, so I've seen it now. So what happens is if you have this on, the circle to search, and you swipe up, yeah, this is pretty much it, I think. It's crazy, it's fast. All right, interesting. I mean, I think you have to use it with the navigation bar. So performance wise, yeah, it's, 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 it's really well maintained, really well managed. I, I generally have no complaints when it comes to the performance at all. So I think they did a great job when it comes to making this an all Snapdragon experience first, optimizing it one UI 6.1 second, the feel of it as well, the heat management with the new larger vapor chamber as well. Benchmarks really well, real world usage is really good. The new you know, AI based features when it comes to onboard, the processing and everything seems really good. I just think overall when it comes to the performance, they've done a great job. So, you know, I'll give this one an 8.5 out of 10, just for the reasons of the fact that although real world and just general performance is great, I would have loved to have seen a true three nanometer process. I think that would have made a real big difference it would have brought the fight to Apple when it comes to raw benchmarking, even faster and even more efficient use of what that experience is meant to bring. But in this particular say, you know, case, TSMC know what they're doing in terms of how they split their fabrication process. I guess the four nanometer process is super mature. Um, everything that's based around AI optimization is really mature. It's, it's one of those where, we take it, it's a strong 8.5 just because Qualcomm's, you know, Snapdragon record has been almost without blemish. And it's something that we just trust a lot more when we see that's what's gonna be powering the device. And we're glad to see that two years in a row, the Ultra Phone gets an all global Snapdragon experience no matter where you buy it, what region. Yeah, you are only gonna be able to find this with an 8 Gen 3 mobile platform built for Galaxy chipset, specially optimized. So we're gonna do display measurement because I was getting ahead of myself and I was really just enjoying it. So this is gonna blow out on the camera. So apologies in advance. And this is just a standard brightness test without auto brightness on in any way and no HDR content, right? So if we're just doing that on a plain high quality white background and we press and hold, let's see what the brightness measurement we're getting. What we're getting here is 538 nits, right, sustained. That's what we're getting. What we're then gonna do is we're gonna open up the 4K HDR test, this one right here. Turn it up to 2160p HDR. Okay, we're gonna open up the window here. Okay, sustained. What we have here is 1610 nits again remember the 2600 peak brightness is with the vision booster and adaptive brightness on it's more for outdoor visibility situations um it's it's basically a strong outdoor brightness mode you have to have adaptive brightness on but if you're using just a standard brightness you've seen the measurements that i've gotten is this with hdr content this is gonna be peaking somewhere around 1,610 nits, which is still great to see. But again, 2,600 nits is with Vision Booster enabled, all right? It's with adaptive brightness on. Um, you've got the extra brightness there. Let's see if the extra brightness helps. So what we get when we enable extra brightness without adaptive brightness on, we go from 540 nits to 919 nits. So definitely, if you use a manual screen brightness and you want that, Take the, take the extra brightness option, makes a difference. We're gonna go to the 4K. It's still roughly the same. So it's, it's just calibrated it to HDR content because obviously this is HDR content. So yeah, couple, couple of takeaways. If you're doing display, if you don't like using uh, adaptive brightness, don't like using adaptive brightness, and you're using manual um, brightness, definitely you want extra brightness and you go all the way up, tick that. It makes a difference, it, double, it doubles it up. So yeah, display. Great display experience that we have here with the S24 Ultra. Really love to see it. Good stuff, Samsung. 
Excellent work. Gone and talked about the design and the build quality. We've talked about the display. We've talked about the performance. What's next? The camera. Right, let's flip this over. Analogy has been very, 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 very similar to what we have across the board here, right? Why is the analogy similar? It's a quad camera system. A large main camera with high megapixels. S22 Ultra was 108 megapixels. Then you obviously had the ultra wide and you got the 10X and you've got the 3X here. It switched, you went to the new 200 megapixel main sensor. You've got an ultra wide, which is obviously um, 0 0.6, 0 0.6. You've got the 3X 10 megapixels and you still had the 10 megapixels 10X zoom. This is the same, except for one, this boy. These three has now changed. We have a new 50 megapixel sensor with a better f-stop at 3.4 instead of 4.9, higher resolution at 50 megapixels, larger sensor, not told us what the sensor size is, better OIS and better stabilization that's built into it from wide OIS, OIS, and video stabilization, picture stabilization, and a system that stabilizes the image is so much better on it. It's 5X, so it's a shorter range, which brings a different interest. Again, if it's not gone live already, I am going to be working on a ultimate and definitive camera comparison between these three devices, so watch out for it. Everything that you've seen, I'm gonna be testing it to really see, is it really a downgrade or not? And I will initially say this right now, this 5X, I'm glad it's here. It doesn't need some fine tuning. I believe it still needs some fine tuning to really make it absolutely bang, but I feel like it's a sidestep in the correct way. So it's not an upgrade in any way, right? When it comes to super, super extended zoom, but it's an upgrade in a sidestep where it's just a much more usable everyday short throw zoom lens. Now, I actually feel like they should have gone with a 6X. I feel like they should have still optimized the aperture to be able to, on a hardware level, be at f2.8, equivalent for that sensor size. But again, when you hear the f-stop, it's not the equivalent to full frame, it's in optimization and scaling to what you are getting on that particular sensor size. Because I think Google and Apple got down to f2.8 and I think it really helps. Um, if you see my camera comparison, there was just moments where you realized that, um, you know, the, pi the pixel just did, it did push out uh, cleaner cleaner images in certain situations. But the 5X, yeah, I'm really glad to see it here. What are some of the key takeaways that we have? 5X allows now to have the most flexible out of the gate portrait mode experience on any camera without needing to post process edit. You have 1X, you've got a 2X, which does a digital process crop on a main camera sensor. You've got a 3X, which is obviously on the dedicated optical 3X here. And then you've got 5X, which is on the dedicated new 5X 50 megapixel main sensor. So that's one of the things that you've got here. Of course, in terms of extended, you've got ultra wide, one, two, three, five now. So if you compare it to what you have from before, you never had that, you know, so five having that five there, and then you start doing the lossless quality, which then bends it down and crops down to 12 megapixels. And then obviously it does all the AI processing through the, um, what do you call it, um, Pro Visual Engine to help balance that as well. So that's one thing that you get. That is that additional, you know, 5X there that really helps it make, you know, that much more usable. Of course, you still got the main camera sensors, which is 50 megapixels. And when you take it to 50 megapixels, it automates it and let you know. So here, because the only super high resolution sensor that you had on here, if you went to 50 megapixels on an S23 Ultra, it would still be on the main one X, but now the 50 megapixel one works on the 5X dedicated because that is also 50 megapixels and you can get that one shot there. You can do extended further crop to 10X within that and you do get higher resolution there. Of course, 200 megapixels is only on the main wide sensor. When you do press and hold, you've got the ability to crop in up to 10X on that 200 megapixel sensor, and then it will accordingly adjust to the output resolution that is needed there. So that's one thing to consider. Of course, you still have the focus enhancer, which is the macro mode on the ultra wide. And yeah, we've got video. Now we've got video. One of the biggest complaints I had, again, I'm just giving you a quick summary. One of the biggest complaints I had with Samsung is they've got the most flexible video recording, and they've always had it in 4K30. So when you're in 4K30, you can record, and obviously what you do have here is the ability to pause recording all in the same clip, continue, you can still take pictures at the same time. You can switch between all the lenses at the back optically. 
right? Without having to stop recording, you can flip to the selfie, right? So you've got a front facing camera, you can pause it, flip it, it's still paused, flip it, it's still paused, you can continue. That's just a level of flexibility, right? On the S23 Ultra, you can do the same. But when you go to 4K60, it locks you out from the lens that you start with. Now you still do have some flexibility. You can pause, continue, take pictures. You can flip to the selfie camera and back to the lens that you start recording. But if you wanted to go to the ultra wide or the optically 3X or the optically 10X, you can't, you have to basically stop recording, then switch, start recording, and continue. Very archaic, very cumbersome. This is a non-issue when you're in 4K30 because when you press it, you can still see the lenses. Um, but when you change it to 4K60, the lens you start on, that's the only lens you see at the back. You can only flip to the front. Gone is that problem. Samsung, you listen to me. 4K60. This now has the most flexible 4K60 camera. And I'm gonna demonstrate it against the competition so you see what I'm talking about. This is the benefit of me showing you compared to what I was telling you in the camera. So 4K60, right, when you press record, you see all the lenses, two, three, five, 10, six, you can still pause recording, flip to the selfie, hey, 4K60 selfie, still take pictures if you want to, hey, and then you can just bang, 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 bang. Continue, stop, continue, right? That is just the level of flexibility that you're getting. If you look at an iPhone, for example, I'm glad that they incorporated this, right? They did, right? So if you go to 4K60 here, yes, you do have the ability to switch between your lenses. And the lens transitions on iPhone are still some of the smoothest that you're gonna find. I'm glad they had added this because this was an issue before. You do have the ability to take pictures at the same time, but there's no pause button. And there's no reverse button. So you can't flip it to yourself. Yes, you can switch between your lenses, but why don't you have the ability to pause recording and continue on the same clip? You can still take pictures, but with how powerful the iPhone is, that's a limitation that makes no sense. So it's kind of like a half-baked, but still decent flexibility, not the full complete flexibility. And the funny thing is, it was the Pixel 7 Pro that started it first. So when you go to here, uh, 4K60, Pixel 7 Pro was the first to do this. So you can press record, you can go to the ultra wide, you can go to the 1X, 2X, 5X. I think lens switching on the Pixel is not as good as the others, definitely not, but you had that flexibility. And you see, you've got the picture button here and you've got the paused. So you see what it says? It says paused. I like the fact that it communicates to you that it's actually paused. That's actually really good. Um, I think Samsung needs to incorporate that where a word comes up saying that you've paused, right? And you can take pictures and you can flip between the lenses at the back, right? But you can't flip to the front facing camera. So again, it builds, it goes in the order of least, all flexible, least flexible 4K60, but still flexible. And then followed by this, which used to be the most flexible from the Pixel 7 Pro and the Pixel 8 Pro. And then the absolutely most flexible 4K60 recording you can get on any smartphone right now, the Galaxy S24 Ultra, love it. But what else do we have? Wow, man, it just doesn't stop. 8K. When we go to 8K, and I love how this is, this was obviously One UI 6, 8K. Now, 8K is still on the main sensor. And if I show you compared to the S23 Ultra, right, you'll see what we have here is 8K. And you can only see the optical on the main wide sensor, but there isn't a 5X option. Yes, when you press and hold, you can do a digital crop on the main sensor to two, four, and six, right? But on that is, that is basically it. That is basically it, right? This, you can press and hold. Obviously, it's not six, it's one, two, four, five. But, you know, because the because this now has a second high resolution sensor, you can do 8K on a 5X optical. That's crazy. <laughs> 8K video on a 5X optical is insane to me. It's absolutely insane to me. Video portrait mode, again, still in 4K. Dual record, this replaces director's view. So if you don't see director's view, this has replaced director's view. So director's view was here, great feature, but only works in 1080p. 
um, you did have multiple options there. So that has replaced um, director's view, just going through the camera. But one benefit that you do get with this is the ability to be able to record in 4K30. So what happens is you pick the two lenses you want to use. And do you know why this is so useful? Let's just say you're at a concert, you're at a football match, and you want to record your, you want to record the front facing camera to record your reactions while recording the rear camera to capture what's happening sports wise and what's happening in the concert. You can do this, you can save it as a picture in picture video or you press it and it allows you to save both files at the same time in 4K. So you can have a 4K image of the rear camera that you're using and then you can have a 4K image of the selfie camera as two separate files at the same time or as a picture in picture. Oh, wow. I can't wait for them to build more on this feature. I love this feature. This is amazing. I'm going to be using it a lot more times than I actually realized. Now that I've explained it to myself, the benefit in a use case scenario, I go to a lot of football matches, go to a lot of concerts. Yeah, I think this would be absolutely a clutch feature to have. Pro Video now gives you the ability to shoot in a high quality slow motion, 4K 120 frames a second. That's the frame rate that my A7S III, the one that I'm using above shoots. And that is something that you can do on a wide and an ultra wide. But here's the trick. If you go into slow motion, right, it's there. You can actually do 4K 120. The thing is, it doesn't allow you to use the ultra wide. So Samsung, you know, don't, I think, bring it in here. And the thing about doing it in a slow motion mode is it takes 120 FPS and will slow it down to 30 FPS for you. It will do it automatically for you. I.e., the correct term for it is, it will conform the footage to 30 FPS for you. One thing I personally like about doing pro video is that when you shoot 120 FPS in, H in UHD 4K, right, it preserves, it preserves the individual frames so you can slow it down yourself manually and it shoots at a nicer and cleaner bit rate as well, which is much higher. Again, apologies for the technicals, but it's kind of just thrown out there to just let you know that this is the situation when it comes to the UHD. But when you are in the pro video mode, you can do the ultra high definition, ultra, resolu ultra HD resolution with higher frame rate. You can do that on the ultra wide as well as the wide. I demonstrated it in my camera comparison with an extensive look. If you go into more, of course, you've got Expert Raw. And you know, by default, Apple does have a 24 megapixel JPEG option. So when you go into your settings, right, you go to camera and you go to format, right? You do have it right here. Photo capture mode is 24 megapixels during daylight by default. And of course, at nighttime, it defaults to 12 megapixels automatically. This is a feature that people are hoping Samsung would bring here, right? where you go to photo and you have a 24 MP option. But what they've done is they've actually put it in Expert Raw. Now, Expert Raw is still a separate application. It's a separate application that behaves like it's attached to the main camera app. It is still a separate application. It, it's, it's good that they've integrated it to make it seem like it's part of the camera app, but it's still a separate application, right? So if you put it this way, if you go add, it grays out and it's not something that you can move here for quicker access. It's not fully, it's kind of embedded, but it's not fully integrated like the others where you can take something and bring it here, right? So just something to consider. It still behaves like a separate app, but it's there and it gives you that features. And what's the benefit? When you go here, it now gives you a 24 megapixel mode, 12 megapixels and 50 megapixels. Now the 24 megapixel mode, if you go to settings here, you can actually do that in RAW. So if you take a picture, it's only on a main wide sensor, right? If you go here and you let it process and process and process and process and process and process, right? Because it's a raw image and it's taking a mixture, you see raw. And then what you're going to see is the metadata that says 24 MP open in Lightroom, um, 9.7 megabytes. So you can do this new 24 megapixel mode as a raw file. It's not just as a JPEG. So there's a level of flexibility there that I really, really appreciate with what Samsung have done, right? But me personally, Samsung, this 24 megapixel mode, I said it to you guys straight. Hey, Joshua Cho, my guy, really appreciate and respect you, man. Um, 
bring that into the main camera app. It doesn't need to be an Expert Raw. Obviously with Expert Raw, you do have a live ND filter mode as well without needing an ND filter. That's something I haven't tested yet. Hopefully I'll do a short form and showcase it. That's something that's really, you know, nice to see. Um, and overall, all I can really recommend is watch my ultimate camera comparison video on the Galaxy S24 Ultra, as well as what you have here with the iPhone 15 Pro Max, Pixel 8 Pro. Um, I delved in hella deep. Obviously, Pixel 8 Pro is on the far left. I always put the latest phone in the middle or the phone of priority and interest in the middle. And then you've got the 15 Pro Max on the right. Um, we're gonna, gonna be following up with uh, um, S23 Ultra versus S22 Ultra, S24 Ultra. If it's not gone live already, if it has, obviously I'll leave a link in the description below on the cards above. Um, and yeah, this is, this is basically what we've got here. I'm gonna give feedback in terms of what I think Samsung's progression of this needs to be, right? Um, this is just my personal take. Um, you can agree to disagree, but I'm liking where some of these manufacturers are going by making the megapixels a complete parity across all the lenses, ultra wide, wide, um, short zoom, as well as extended zoom, whether it's 3X or 6X, however they want to do it. I personally do not like the mismatch of high resolution, low resolution, 200 megapixels overkill. I personally think there needs to come to a point where they need to stick to 50 megapixels on the main wide sensor. This 200 megapixel sensor, personally to me, it doesn't 100% do it for me. I think, in my opinion, this 200 megapixel sensor is giving Samsung too much processing to do. I think they need to stick to a 50 megapixel sensor, in my personal opinion, for the main. Um, I'm glad they've moved to a 50 megapixel sensor on the periscope, just to refine it, put a faster lens in there in terms of f2.8 or lower, make it sharper, better stabilization, tune it, just keep working on that 5X, great, I love to see it. I think next they need to find a way to give the 3X zoom that same 50 megapixel treatment, make the aperture better, make it a much better quality 3X zoom lens, move to 50 megapixels on it, make it a larger sensor, put better wires, make the lens faster as well. That needs to be given a high resolution treatment. It needs to move away from 10 megapixels. And of course they need to put a 50 megapixel on the ultra wide. I personally think Samsung's ultra wide isn't as ultra wide as the others, hence why it's a 0.6 perspective field of view compared to a 0.5 perspective field of view. So that's just something to consider in my particular opinion that I would like a slightly wider field of view. And I would also like a slightly wider field of view on a front facing camera selfie as well. I feel like it's slightly more cropped in compared to the competition where at arm's length, it feels like it's really, really in your face. So I would want a slightly wider field of view on a selfie. That's something that Google does really well. Even Huawei does really well for that. If I'm gonna be honest with the review that I did with the Pixel, with the P60 Pro and their camera system, um, so I think they need to go all 50 megapixels. I think they just need to can this 200 megapixel main sensor. I don't really like it. I kind of respect how well they are making it work, but I think they just need to move away from it in my personal opinion. Um, I think that's one of the ways that it's gonna improve. Why is that gonna help if everything's high megapixels at 48, 40, or 50? What that basically means is that you can progressively have a much better consistent image across the board for photos and videos. What also that means is that you can, you know, build on the 8K experience across the world because with an 8K experience, it's about 33.3 megapixels on a 16 by nine image. These camera sensors are usually on a four by three or three by two shape. So what that basically means is to get 8K, they do have to lose pixels at the top and the bottom to get that 16 by nine wide frame, meaning that 50 megapixels, 50 megapixels, wherever you lose at the top or the bottom, it gives you that 33 megapixel image with no crop. So again, that's just you know something that it builds on. That means ultra wide can be 8K if they want to, main can be 8K, zoom on a 3X can be 8K, zoom on a 5 or 6X can be 8K. Right now, it's progressing there. I love to see the zoom on the 8K for the 5X, as well as the 8K on the main wide tensor. But again, give the high resolution treatment to the ultra wide and the 3X, they'll get 8K too because the image processing is there. And then you can build on making it being a seamless experience of being able to switch between the lenses in 8K, as well as being able to do that on a selfie on the 8K as well. So that's just where my opinion is. 
bigger pixels as well. Um, it's gonna be better for low light rather than having effective pixels through pixel binning. You're gonna have true larger pixel size micron in the surface area. Don't know how expensive it's gonna be in terms of outsourcing the sensor size and whatnot. I'm not an engineer to put that together on what the challenges are, but I just feel like if they can optimize it in that direction, they can really get there and bring that perspective in, uh, personal opinion. I think that's just where I want the ultra camera system to work and go. Okay, let's talk all things in terms of the editor. So there's so much when it comes to, you know, uh, what you're able to do here um, in terms of, shout out to BTEC. <laughs> uh, my son. Okay, let's, 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 let's edit BTEC care. All right, so we're gonna click on here when it comes to generate. Uh, we're gonna zoom and Let's see. So if someone doesn't take a straight picture. All right, let's press generate. Let's just do a basic example. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, interesting. <laughs> interesting. View original. So if you press and hold view original, that's what you get there. Okay. Uh, discard. Let me see if there's anything else to discard. Let's do, let's do this. This is gonna be quite complex. Let's do an edit. We're gonna do generate. We're gonna rotate. Right, we're gonna rotate it here. We're gonna generate. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, it's quite complex, this one. It's quite complex, this one. It's quite complex, this one. So we're gonna discard. And let's see, let's see one of me here. So, press edit. We're gonna, boom, tap around, move me. Let's see, I move, I'm gonna make myself bigger in front here. Uh, and let's see how we generate. All right, I've moved myself here, made myself taller. Let's see how dodgy it's gonna make this whole thing. So again, we're going through the photo editor. Uh, have a look. Interesting. Let's view original. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a miss still. Uh, let me go back, discard. Uh, we're gonna try and generate another one and see. I'm gonna press and hold. Select me, I'm gonna place me here make me a little bit bigger and then let's click generate and see how it does so interesting yeah it's still it's still kind of a, a miss so these features are quite new and of course they said that it is going to be free for about a year or two up until 2025 so i don't know how they're going to do it so so yeah those are some of the ai based um editing tools i'm still getting used to them but the overall camera experience, um, yes. Sometimes the processing on the saturation side of things really kicks up heavy. Um, again, personally, you go watch my ultimate camera comparison, the definitive one, that will give you all the things that you need. But the camera experience, I would say I'm impressed. I just feel progressively, they do need to move away from the mismatch in resolution. Having a 12 megapixel ultra wide, a 200 megapixel main sensor, um, a 10 megapixel 3X and then a 50, you know, it's just jumbled. Let's move to a place where 50 megapixels is a sweet spot, 48 megapixels is a sweet spot. It enables you to have the ability to shoot 8K and you can just work with a lot more resolution and a bigger sensor size. I think just we need to get to a point where we're not mismatching resolutions and stuff get to the same resolutions across the board. You know, at that period when we're doing 12 megapixel everywhere at a 4K era, it was amazing, right? And with this situation, it's like, I've, I just think we're going too high on one, too low on up, you know, make everything 50 megapixel for Samsung. That's what's gonna be the next progressive place. You were brave enough to get rid of the 10X and make it a sidestep. And yes, of course, the outright zoom capabilities might not be absolutely as strong in a 10X, but actually it's more usable. If you keep tuning it and you put a newer version with a faster lens, bigger sensor, better tuning and better glass, 
and everything that comes with it, I think we can justify it being a 5X. Maybe I think you need to move to a 6X in my opinion and make it a one main X wide, improve the ultra wide to 1.5, have a 50 megapixel main wide sensor, have a 50 megapixel 6X, uh, 3X, have a 50 megapixel 6X that can extend and have that flexibility. In my opinion, I think that's where we need to go. And I think, in my opinion, Samsung shouldn't have really ever introduced a 100X. I think they should have stuck with a 50X that was on the Note 20 Ultra, in my personal opinion, built that platform around a 50X space zoom. I think 100X should have really have been a thing, but again, my personal opinion, this is where the progression I think needs to be Samsung. Hey, if you want to consult me, you know me. I know my stuff when it comes to the camera usability experience that comes with it. I'd love to. Overall, I love the camera experience. The experience is great. The usability is so much better now. Again, we talked about the shutter speed, right? We're going to be looking at S20 free uh, Ultra here. We're going to go to the top down. Right, intelligent um, optimization. You can see here, scene optimizer. I turned it on, but it comes off by default now. So I'll probably do a camera comparison between the two. Um, here we are at the maximum, not even min um, um, prioritizing that for speed, right? So if we go here and we go here, you can see the capture speed has greatly improved. So you can see it, you can just see it. Capture speed has greatly improved and that's one thing I'm really, really impressed with when it comes to what they've been able to do with the capture speed experience and that's with their default 12 megapixel bin mode. Uh, sorry, I think I might have switched it to 50. So my bad. Okay, let me try this again. So you can see capture speed has greatly improved. But overall, camera experience wise, really happy with the progression there in the right direction. But I just think the real, 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 real difference maker is when they move away from this 200. I'm going to be the first one to call it. They should have never, the, the new platform change from the 108 megapixel sensors that they were having, it should have been our new generation 50 megapixel. I just don't really vibe with it. We need to move away from a mix match resolution on the sensors, go 50 megapixel all the way on all of them, make the lens as fast quality as possible, and it will just bring more consistency and it will just be something that they need to work on their processing, especially when it comes to noise reduction is really better in video, um, processing when it comes to saturation and skin tones. Uh, skin tones is actually not bad. Saturation at times, especially when it's night mode, it can overpower itself too much where it can be a bit too, you know, over greened. So the processing still needs a little bit of tuning, especially on the 5X. Um, it's a great 5X lens, I'm glad it's there. Probably needs slightly more tuning and I trust that in software optimizations they'll do that. But for now, with what we, we've been given and put out there, these are the generative editing features that we've shown you. And yeah, this is the camera experience with it. I give it a solid 8.5. Um, sometimes it's actually an eight. Sometimes it probably falls to a 7.8 in some situations. But for me, I'm confident that the flexibility of the 8K, the, the flexibility of the 4K 60 recording, the flexibility of the 4K 30 recording, the dual recording feature, 8K in one and a 5X, um, video portrait mode in 4K. There's so much usability and flexibility that I'm happy to give up some odd inconsistencies here and there because that level of flexibility is going to make it able for me to capture more memories than any other phone, how I want, when I want. And I'm sorry to say this, that counts for way more than anything else, than outright quality as such, as a smartphone, right? I'm not looking for super, super, super outright quality. Yes, I want it, especially in these flagship phones that are costing over a thousand pounds or more, right? But I want a much faster, simpler, easier access, a more usable and flexible camera anytime. And it's yeah, they're on, they're on, they're on the tiptoes. Samsung, bring the 24 megapixel mode into the main camera sensor. Allow the ultra wide for the 4K 120 where it conforms the slow motion mode in the slow motion mode. Don't leave it in just the pro mode for video, but it's there. I appreciate it. And I appreciate that the pro mode allows you to shoot individual frames. I appreciate that there's a 24 FPS mode for video in the in slow motion and adjustments, but bring it all into the main camera app. Again, camera, camera app experience 8.5 as a whole. 
put my feelings and my opinions on what I think needs to improve and what needs to be better. But overall, man, yeah, I love it. My new favorite camera system on a smartphone. Now we are pretty much at the battery. What we have here is a 5,000 5, milliamp hour battery. So I'm gonna go here about phone battery information. It's a 5,000 milliamp hour battery. Obviously the rated battery is 4,855 milliamps. Um, 5,000 milliamp hour battery. It still does support Samsung super fast charging 2.0. Again, I have done a charging test video. Um, it is gonna be coming out if it's not out already by the time you watch this. Um, and it does support that. Um, again, it is a 45 watt charger. Um, roughly charges around one hour. You do have to use a five amp cable for it to show super fast charging 2.0 active. If you use anything less, even if you've got a 45 watt charger, it will not work. So again, this is Samsung's official 45 watt charger right here. So just to put it in perspective, that is their 45 watt charger. So if I do plug it in, it will say super fast charging, but not 2.0, because it's not a five amp cable. So you can see it will say super fast charging, right? But it will not indicate the 2.0 because it needs a five amp cable. So. This is a shielded, braided, high quality cable. If we plug it in and we go here, you will see that it says super fast charging 2.0. And that's because this is a five amp compatible cable. So that's how you get your super fast charging 2.0 for the faster speeds, even if you are using it. Um, again, no charger in the box, so you do have to get that separately just something to consider. So I still want Samsung to move to a 65 watt charging solution. What it basically means is instead of it charging roughly around one hour to full charge, it will charge to full between somewhere around 40 to 45 minutes. I think that's a really, really much better place for it to be. Anything else beyond that, I think it's overkill. I don't need the phone to recharge in half an hour. It's a nice luxury, but I do want the phone to charge to full between 40 to 45 minutes. And I think 65 watts, that extra 20 watts would really help with that. That's the technology that they've got on tap. They use that on their tablets. I think they need to bring it to their ultra phone. Um, wireless charging is 15 watts. I think that needs to move up to 30 watts if that's possible. But again, it's a bit conservative in terms of how they're doing it, in my opinion. So just something to consider in that, um, in respect to. Um, but overall, it's respectable. Um, battery life is, you know, is good. Battery experience overall, it's a copy and paste job from the S23 Ultra. Um, I was hoping that they were at least gonna put 65 watts in that. I still think they need to. I think I still think they have to because of the competition and just the situation. I think sometimes fluctuating to 100% charge around one hour, slightly over or maybe slightly less. Uh, we want it to be solid under an hour where 45 minutes of full charge. Yeah, I'll be very happy with it. But yeah, that's the battery experience when it comes to the Galaxy S24 Ultra. We're gonna switch the software and talk all things related to software. What do we have when it comes to the software experience? Okay, just so we don't show certain things. So what we got here is the latest update. We've got 6.1, right? 1st of January. We'll see if there is an update tomorrow to fix anything. We're gonna go to about phone, software information. Not what we have here, Android 14. What do we have in terms of the feature sets? Of course, you know, we've got things like, you know, the interpreter. So you've got obviously live translate, which is what it works with when it comes to, uh, just don't want to expose the uh, settings, live translate. So live translate is here. So if I enable it, so we go to English, United Kingdom for me, no, German, no, no. English, United Kingdom for me, we're going to download. So you obviously have to download the packs and whatnot. Okay, so we'll look through other person's language. Um, there's 13. So obviously we had that demonstrated in Korean, but you know, you can obviously call as part of the call assist feature. Um, I'll demonstrate this a different time. Obviously I don't have anyone in a different language that I can, you know, call right now and get that demonstrated. Uh, there we go. Um, obviously you've got things like uh, the transcribe features with Samsung keyboard, uh, where you're able to obviously transcribe and summarize. You've got, you know, Samsung notes. So with the notes, uh, not now, 
is stuff that you can summarize. If you go here, you know, it's there's there's a lot. No assist. So obviously no assist is on. So being able to summarize and stuff. Again, it's 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 all it's all it's all really relative and it's all good in that sense. So voice recorder's got the voice assist as well, the transcript assist right here. So that's another thing to consider when it comes to obviously being able to transcribe different um, styles for interviews, standard. So being able to get multiple um, call, um, um, people in there. So you've got all your recordings. If you transcribe, okay, interesting. And you can go to summary. I think mean, this is old 2017 recording. So, okay, this is my S7 Edge long-term review. Discuss an S7 Edge, one of the best phones for 2077. Um, evaluating it is still worth considering 2077 and Mr. Newer Phones provided. Ah, interesting. Okay. Uh, that's, that's That was my old, that was, that was me starting out. Okay, interesting, interesting, interesting. And then obviously what you can do further is you can transcribe it and change it to a different language. So you can translate it and you've got the German that's there as well. So it's really, really powerful stuff. It's really powerful. I think it's, it's, it's in a great place to start. It's really powerful stuff. And of course, if you're using a Samsung keyboard as well, it will give you different suggestions. Um, let's go here. So if you can see, translate chats and writing style, okay? How, how are you? So writing style, professional, how, how do you do? How's it going? I like that. How are you? How are you doing? How are you, you know? So yeah, you've got different, you know, obviously spelling and grammar, that's something I really appreciate because boy, boy, believe I, I struggle with that. And then obviously chat translation as well, which is great, um, which, you know, you can change, let's just say German, and it changes it to German. So it's really, really powerful stuff. Like I actually really like it. I really like it. I really like it. I think it's really good. You know, there's some ways, there's so many different, like I showed you the editing stuff for, it's crazy. There's, there's a lot here. There's a lot here when it comes to how it's working. And then of course you've got circle by, okay, let's see, let's see if I go into, let's go here. And then we're gonna circle this. Interesting. Search is actually very fast, but it hasn't got the right place, but maybe that's quite tough for me to do. Let's do this and circle the BB droid. didn't get the BD droid correct. <laughs> All right, let's do the uh, SAP center, for example, right? And see if it can get where the SAP center is. All right, so we're gonna do search. And then we're gonna circle SAP. And it says there, SAP center. So I like the speed of it, man. Santa Clara Street, San Jose, CA. Bam, SAP Center. Circle by search with Google, that's probably gonna be my favorite one. It's fast, I just like the speed of it. I like the speed of it. Again, um, software-wise, I'm not really so, so hella pressed about software, in my opinion. I'm more of like, you know, someone that focuses on the camera, battery experience, display experience, performance and stuff like that, that's me personally. But software-wise, man, I dig it. Software-wise, One UI is the place for me to be. I do appreciate the aesthetics that comes with the Pixel experience when it comes to Google, in terms of, you know, Material U and the aesthetics and the design and the vertical drawer and just how, the haptics and stuff, I do appreciate it, but it's just, in terms of a feature set and now the performance that comes with this platform and everything, yeah, honestly, yeah, this this is, uh, software-wise, is great. Now we've pretty much gone through everything that we have on here, man. The price of the Galaxy S23 Ultra 
is in a very high place. $1,299, effectively the same in UK pounds, £1,249. And you could be spending upwards of close to £1,600. Is it worth it? Um, I think it's worth it for the principle of if you're doing an ultra, do an ultra properly and unapologetically, in my opinion. Do it where there's no holds, no holds barred, because once you go over a thousand pounds, phones are default not worth it. You should not inherently need to be spending this much, but you see, when you're justifying things like seven years of OS version updates and security updates that come with it, when you're justifying the performance that comes with it on a hardware level, with additional high megapixel cameras that can shoot 8K, that have the flexibility to not stop recording when you're in 4K 60, and you're also able to do macro mode, you're able to do 24 megapixels. You're able, like it becomes more justifiable when so many things are done right. The use of titanium, the use of a new generation front glass that makes it so much less reflective, a clearer image, a much better experience, symmetrical borders, flat display that makes it easier to manage with screen protectors, high resolution, 120 Hertz, Super AMOLED when it's dynamic 2X, and also the ability to push beyond a high crazy 2000 plus nit. When you add it all up with the S Pen support, with everything that comes with it, the big battery, the fast charge, it becomes more worth it and justified. Do I still think this is the perfect device? It's the perfect device for me. It's still my phone of the year so far, and it's still my phone of the year where I'm that damn impressed as a complete compelling package. There is, is that is that the end game? No, I've, I've described that, you know, they need to move to an all 50 megapixel high resolution sensor platform for the rear cameras and also high resolution for the selfie. Go back to the 48 and the 40 megapixel selfie so it can shoot 8K as well. Build from that. There's so much that I still believed they can do to really, really nail it. And I think they've dropped, they drop it to 50 megapixels on the main sensor, work on the tuning and the processing. It will still be one of the best when it comes to video and it can really match and beat the iPhone. It comes close actually. And it's the best that you see on an Android, but it's just one thing to consider. Overall though, man, this is a solid, 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 strong nine out of 10 for me.